just thinking as we prepare to get into our study this morning, I don't know if this has worked this way for all of you. This year's Bible reading plan has really spoken to me in some very personal ways. And I have been amazed week after week that there's at least one of those five readings that speaks with tremendous relevance that I bring before you on Sunday morning. And I've been thinking that throughout the weeks of this year, the circumstances and the times that we have been through, I have a greater appreciation for the wisdom of God who has directed us in those readings, knowing our days ahead before they were lived out, and knowing that we would need certain passages at certain times, again and again I have been reminded of his leading in that. I am reminded of that again today, and I'm encouraged by that. So I have a greater appreciation of the infinite wisdom and sovereignty of God as I've considered how our reading plan has gone throughout this year. So having said that, I'd like to ask you to turn in the Old Testament to the book of Isaiah, chapter 60. I guess I've also thought in, in, in what I would share in sermons, I might not have picked out uh, any other way the passages that I have been picking out if it were not for the plan that we're following. Isaiah 60 might not have been a passage that I would have naturally gravitated to, but I am so glad I've been drawn to it and that we can share from it this morning. Verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine. Rise and shine. I heard that phrase a lot growing up. <laughs> I, I used to love to sleep till about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning when school was out during summer vacation. And uh, that didn't always work well with a dad who liked to get up early. And I don't know how many times I would hear such thing as, you're going to sleep till noon, which I probably would have, uh, or get up, you're burning daylight. Because he had things to do and things he thought I ought to do. And so I remember hearing that, probably most of us at some point or the other, probably especially back in childhood, have heard that phrase then, rise and shine. You go to camp, usually on the program, they list the activities, and the first thing is rise and shine at 7 a.m. or whatever time it is that they have set. I think I know what it means to rise. The, the business of shining, I'm not quite sure I always understood. But when I read this verse, I wonder, is that where the phrase rise and shine came from was what Isaiah said about arise and shine. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And I don't think Isaiah is just talking about the morning that it's time to get up for that reason. There's a special significance in prophetic words to people that desperately needed to hear what God said through this prophet. The message that we read in this chapter... These were promises made to a very weary and defeated people. If you were to go back and understand the, the setting and the circumstances with the people of Israel, the people of God, they had been disobedient as they had been so many times in their experience in their lives. But in the particular time of disobedience, God's punishment was upon them. They were taken off into exile to Babylon, taken away from their homes and away from their homeland. And I pause and I linger there for just a little bit because just that fact alone is hard for me to understand. I cannot fathom what it would be like to be forcibly dragged from my home and dragged from this land that I'm familiar with. You know, I mean, start to think about what they've been through. These were the circumstances. So imagine that, that you were dragged out of your house. You were dragged away from this land that you love and enjoy, taken off to another land forced into another lifestyle, forced to live where you don't want to live. Those are the circumstances of the people of God, the backdrop up against which Isaiah writes these words. Things could not have been any worse for them. In fact, if you back up a chapter to chapter 59, I kind of hate to read these words because they're depressing, but I want us to get our minds around their circumstances. However bad we have it, the point is they had it worse. But sometimes we can relate to these words. Verses 9 to 11 of chapter 59. Therefore justice is far from us. And righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness. 
for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday, as at the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears. I like that. Moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. Wow. I read those words and I think they had it bad. Like I say, sometimes we might think we got it bad. We might relate to that, say, yeah, things aren't so great. And I kind of groan and I kind of relate to those words. Those were the dismal circumstances of the people of God when Isaiah wrote what we read in the opening verses of chapter 60. Again, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and His glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. It's a phenomenal promise to a people who were down and out, who have it incredibly bad, Isaiah, under inspiration of God, says, yes, but there are better times coming. There is brightness and there is light that's going to come back to you amidst the darkness and amidst the gloom. This whole chapter and this whole section in Isaiah, it's really a prophecy of God's future plan for the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem in particular. And so again, while things were dismal and bad as they've ever been, God says a bright spot is, I've got good plans for you, good things out there yet in the future. And so it's really a kingdom promise because time and again we read in Scripture that God has a plan for the nation of Israel and Jerusalem to be the very centerpiece of the coming kingdom of God that we all long for and that we focus on so much. There is the promise of that light as he refers to the coming kingdom, but there's more to it than that. The promise of light has something to do also with the brightness of God's Son, who would rise up from the people of Israel as well. If you look to head into verse 6 in Isaiah chapter 60, there's an interesting thing said about that they will bring gold and frankincense. You all read that somewhere else? You heard about that somewhere else? Sounds to me like a reference to the wise men bringing those precious gifts to the Christ child. And so a part of the brightness and the light that was in the future for them was the fact that God's Son would arise out of the midst of those people. Chapter 9 of Isaiah, verse 2, says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Very special verse because that, I believe, refers to the light of God's Son coming. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, that very prophecy is quoted when it says, The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand brightness, the light for the people of God, the people of Israel, was the Son of God appeared in their midst. And I just love that, describing the beginning of His ministry, that the people saw a great light. They, they eyeballed the Son of God, the, the brightest light of all, in a sense. And also, when they were looking upon that light, it says synonymous with, with that, that He began to preach the message of the kingdom of God. So the true light for the people of God back then was the Son of God appearing on the scene and declaring and demonstrating the message of the kingdom of God, certainly the ultimate of the great light. It all comes down to us today as we think about this imagery of light and brightness. We are those who have seen the light of Christ. We have seen Him as the Son of God. We know that Jesus is the Christ, And we also recognize this great kingdom of God message. You know that I can't talk about him without talking about the kingdom because they go hand in hand. That is the good news of Scripture. It's great news that he appeared and offered his life as a sacrifice, but it's phenomenal news 
that he came onto the scene through his miracles and through his healings to declare and to demonstrate there's something else coming. There's a great day coming. There's a kingdom that will come through the Christ. We are those who have literally seen the light. We see the Christ and we see his message. And so as those who have been enlightened in a very real sense, we're called to live the lifestyle of those who live in that light. I'd like you to jump ahead to Ephesians chapter 5 for just a bit. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I'd like to look at verses 6 through 16 in that passage. I, again, it's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 16. The Apostle Paul writes to us. He says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, and we pause for a moment on the these things, the previous verses, he talks about an ungodly lifestyle. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So he challenges, therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness. You used to live that way. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Deeds of darkness. That's why the wrath of God will eventually come. And we are told very clearly, those who practice such things can expect the wrath of God on judgment day. And so Paul appeals to us to step away from that, instead arise in, and shine in Christ and reject those practices and embrace the lifestyle of the people of light. We are light in the Lord, as Paul says, and so therefore we are to walk as children of light. That's as basic as it gets, but how very, very important it is. We need to be reminded of that from time to time. If I profess to belong to the one who is light then it behooves me to walk in a light lifestyle, to live the kind of lifestyle that is consistent with that practice. So we are the enlightened ones, therefore we are to walk as children of light. So again, we go back to Isaiah when he says to us, Arise and to shine. Those are two action words. And I think when we are called upon to arise and shine, even as the people of Israel were called upon to do, that we, the people of God, cannot and must not live passive lives. That's what I walk away with when I read those words. Arise, rise up and to shine means that we live an active lifestyle that pleases our Lord. One writer says, arise, we need to cease walking with the world. We are mission oriented. We need to arise from compromise with the world and to strive for the glory of God's kingdom. I say amen to that. That's right. That's what I understand about arise from what uh, Isaiah the prophet says to us. If I am to arise, I rise up from walking the way of the world. We rise up from walking the way of the world. The world has a mindset. The world has a way it wants us to, to walk. We rise up and say, we're not going to go that way. We're not going to walk that way. We are a mission-oriented people. We rise up away from compromise with the world. And as that writer says, we strive for the glory of God's kingdom. We're all about the king and about the kingdom. And so we rise up to walk in that way, to be obedient to that mission that is set before us. I hope you notice what we print on the cover of the bulletin week after week. It's more than just a good saying. This is the mission that we are oriented towards. Teaching, training, living the kingdom message. We, the people of God, rise up for that mission and that purpose. That's what I believe we are about. It is our objective to constantly teaching, directly and indirectly, to be teaching the kingdom message. 
training the next generation, training all that are willing in the ways of the kingdom of God, living it, trying to embody the kingdom message, which means we embody the lifestyle of the king as well. So we arise to that great purpose. To arise is literally to stand up. Rise up, O men of God, one of the old hymns uh, states. And as the people of God, we do. We rise up in purpose. We rise up to do that which God desires of us. I'm reminded that God called Abraham long ago to arise and walk through the length and the width of the promised land, according to Genesis 13, 17. Rise up and walk through the land that I have for you. I think God calls us to do the same thing. Arise. Walk in my promises. Walk in what I have designed for you. Walk in the territory that I have for you, the people of God. God calls us to rise up, to stand up in His promises. To stand up in the promises through His Son, Jesus Christ, the great light that Isaiah, the prophet, talked about. And so we rise up. We rise up in the power of Christ, in the name of Christ, in His message concerning the kingdom of God. I believe the Apostle Paul had a goal to rise up in Christ and in the power of his resurrection. Because when I think of the word arise, I also think of resurrection. But I love the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. You probably know them well. Paul said, this is my mission, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul wanted to rise up. Paul wanted to arise. And Paul knew the promise was made that he would arise in resurrection, but that was not enough for Paul, any more than it should not be enough for each one of us. Sure, we look forward to the resurrection. I'm thinking this week in particular, we've been reminded of how bright and important that is. We've gone with two families through a time of grieving, and we're reminded about resurrection. And we long to, to be able to rise up on that day, to be changed and to be reunited with loved ones. Paul, I believe, believed in resurrection, certainly, but that was not enough. Paul wanted to know, he said, the power of the resurrection of Christ right now in his mortal life. Amen. That's what I want as well. I, I believe in that promise. I long for that day. But I want the power of resurrection today. Amen. Isn't that what we, the people of God, want to be living in? Not just longing for, but living in the power of resurrection today. So that's what I think it means to arise as we go back to Isaiah. Rise up in the power of the risen Christ, which Isaiah probably only had a, a slight glimmer concerning. But we know today that, and we echo the words of Paul. We want to arise, and so we want to enjoy resurrection life now as we anticipate it in the future. Isaiah said, arise, shine. It is not just enough to rise. We, the people of God, are called to also shine. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. We are declared to be the light of the world. Again, as Isaiah said to the people of Israel, arise, shine. They were called to rise up and shine. We are shining as the people of God. We are declared by Jesus to be the light of the world. And so therefore we set the light in such a way that the world will look at it and not say, well, what great people they are. No, it's not about our glory. We let it shine in such a way that they see a consistent lifestyle and instead of saying how good you are, wow, how great God is. And so they give the glory to God. They glorify God because they see our light shining. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Isn't that a great verse? God said light will shine out of darkness. It takes us back to Genesis. And we think about how originally the physical light would shine out of the darkness. But that's merely an image of a greater light. 
There is light that would shine out of the darkness of sin, out of humanity. There would be the light that would shine forth in Christ and the light that shines in our hearts. God has shown into our hearts the light. He's given us a knowledge of His glory, a knowledge of Him, and it's to be found in the face of Christ. I'm so glad we live this side of the coming of Christ. You think of the prophets, the people of God, longing to know the times and the seasons, longing to know who the Son of God would be. 2,000 years on the other side of things, we know that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God and the light of God. And we're privileged to see the details that they could only begin to glimpse at back in those days. God has shown in our hearts, as much as we were willing to let that light shine and accept it in, God has shown in our hearts. And so we have the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so then we are called upon to be light and to let our light shine. Reminded that we can only shine our light as it has been shining in our lives as well. We have no light within us. There's nothing but darkness in our lives naturally. But as God has shown His light through Christ into our lives, we have a light that can be reflected. And so I think we're more like the moon than the sun. The moon in its brilliance is only reflected from the sun, and so it is with us. We shine as we reflect what has come into our hearts and into our lives. Arise and shine. I think that we are shining. To talk about rising up and shining, to say that the people of God in this room are not, no. Not saying that in any way at all. We are shining. And I know there are specific ways people in this room are shining. As we said a little bit ago, I know we've been involved in comforting and helping a couple of grieving families this week in specific ways. We were shining as we did those things. I know that there are deeds and acts of goodness that are carried out every week by people in this room, deeds that are known only to the individual and to God and by no one else. That's how it ought to be. We are shining as we do those things. So the call to shine does not say we aren't. The call to shine is to say to us, let us continue to be faithful to shine as we have been called to shine. Again, we shine because we have not only a wonderful Savior, but we have a bright future literally before us. Daniel, the 12th chapter, verse 3, has been an intriguing verse to me for a long time. And it talks about brightness and shining. It says concerning Resurrection Day, or at least I believe that's what it's about, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The phrase, those who have insight, I believe refers to the people of God. Those that have insight on resurrection day will shine brightly, it says, like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. We'll shine like the sun, if I understand that correctly. And those who shine are those who lead the many to righteousness. I often overlook that phrase, but that's an important phrase as well that we who have been enlightened are those who are active light bearers to others, leading many to righteousness. And so that brings us back to our prime mission, that we are a people who evangelize and who make disciples. Because that's what the light said to us as the light bearers, is to go out and to make disciples of all peoples. And so that is a, a key part of letting our light shine. Again, our motivation to be light bearers, to let our light shine, is the light which is to come. Later on in chapter 60 in Isaiah, verses 19 to 22, to the end of that chapter, some phenomenal promises about literally how bright our future is. Verse 19, Isaiah says, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord, the Lord God, for an everlasting light, and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane. For you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The smallest one will become a clan, and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord will hasten it in its time. In the age to come. 
You want to talk about light. There'll be light like we don't have a clue about today. God himself will be our light. That is also mentioned in the last book. You know full well, Revelation 20, uh, 21, excuse me, talks about the fact that God will come and dwell in our midst. And we are told that his light will be sufficient for us in the age to come. So we know we have a bright future as the enlightened ones today. We will, as it says here, possess the land forever. Tremendous promise to us who understand there will be a brightness on this earth like does not exist today. We look forward to that brightness. The brightness of renewal at the return of Christ. The brightness eventually, again, of God's presence upon this planet. And it will happen quickly because the very last verse, God says, I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. And I think that we look and say, you know, it's been so long, the kingdom has not yet come, we're still living in this present evil age, when is it going to happen? God's kind of slow about things. God says, I will hasten it in its time. And what I understand of that is that when it happens, it will happen very quickly. And I think that fits full well with what Jesus says at the very end in Revelation. Behold, I come quickly. We easily misunderstand that and say, I'm going to come back soon. He didn't say, I'll be coming soon. I will come quickly. When I come, it unfolds with tremendous rapidness. And so God, when he brings that light to earth, I will hasten it in its time. It is up to us to be faithful and wait for that time to come. Again, we have a bright future. <clears throat> As the enlightened people of God, our challenge is to let our light shine as we wait for that bright future to be a reality. Along the lines of what we've been talking about, there is a story, and I may have shared it with you before, but I think it fits so well with these thoughts in this text. It is a famous story about an incident that took place uh, back during the colonial days of this country. And I just want to read to you how one historian recorded it. The 19th of May, 1780, was a remarkably dark day. Candles were lighted in many houses. The birds were silent and disappeared, and the fowls retired to roost. The legislature of Connecticut was then in session at Hartford. A very general opinion prevailed that day that the day of judgment was at hand. The House of Representatives, being unable to transact their business, adjourned. A proposal to adjourn the council was under consideration. When the opinion of one Colonel Davenport was asked, he answered, I am against an adjournment. The day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. If it is, I cho choose to be found doing my duty. I wish, therefore, that candles may be brought. I like that story. Because on a day that was an extraordinary day, a very dark day, I suppose it was easy for people to assume that the day of judgment was at hand, and so be that the case, this is not a normal business day, let's adjourn and get on with other things. But apparently there was one individual who had the right perspective, and I think it is the kind of perspective that we, the people of God, ought to have as well. It's either the day of judgment or it's not. Either way, it's time to be up and about what we're called to be up and about. And so the desire was for candles to be brought in, to let the light shine, and I would say that fits our situation as well. If we're approaching the day of judgment, we believe that we are. But regardless, we are called to be consistently about being people of light. As I, Isaiah said in chapter 60, verse 2 that we read a little bit ago, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. I think we would say this is a dark time in history. That as we approach the end of the age, it's going to be incredibly dark. And so we see the day of judgment come. Do we decide to adjourn and do whatever else we want to do? No, we stay the course. We do those things that are important because we're called to arise and shine and to let our light shine. And so that is the challenge for us today and every day as we look forward to the brightness of the age to come, even as we face some dark days before that happens. Those are our marching orders and priorities. Amen?